What is quantum? Well, quantum physics is the science that describes the laws of subatomic particles, such as protons and neutrons you see there in the middle, and electrons uh, surrounding the nucleus, and their strange behavior. Well, what kind of strange behavior? Well, such as an electron and a positron that they attract and that they annihilate, such as this. But yet, an electron takes an orbital path around a proton. Now, why is that strange? It's strange because the proton and the positron have the exact same charge, plus one. But that orbital path, well, it's not really actually an orbital. That electron has the probability of being anywhere. See a little blue dot? There's an electron. There's an the electron. There's an the electron. Right, the orbital is really just the most probable location. And it's a probability cloud where the electron could be, but it's interesting because the shape of that cloud begins to change as you add more protons to the atomic element. And those orbitals, well, they come in distinct energy levels, and the electron makes a jump between those levels called a quantum leap. It doesn't go from, let's say, 1 to 2. It might go from 1 to 4, skipping 2 and 3. Why is that? A little bit more background. In the 1900, those energy levels of the atom uh, led to Max Planck's work on electromagnetic energy and that it could only be emitted in quantized form. It's the roots of the word quantum. And in 1925, Schrodinger developed the equation for describing quantum mechanical behavior. And then a couple years later, the Copenhagen interpretation is really the foundation of quantum mechanics. And this really is amazing. You have um, Einstein along with how many of the great minds uh, all together in a room to develop this. But what comes out of it is, is a very strange interpretation. And this is just one of them, right? When the measurement of a wave particle is made, its wave function collapses. What does that mean? The electron can be anywhere and is everywhere until the point where we measure it. It's observed, and then it has a specific location. That's strange. It's really strange. And that was the beginning of quantum mechanics and the split of two different branches of physics, one for the large and one for the small particles, such as that. And different laws apply. Classical laws, such as being able to calculate the orbit of the moon around the Earth, well, it's very much known. We can do that. We know precisely where the moon will be. But yet quantum physics, quantum mechanics has a very different set of laws, right? And it's the probability of the electron being somewhere around the atom. Why are there different laws? Especially considering that the Earth, like everything else around us, everything, is made of these same subatomic particles. So how can planets be calculated precisely when its components are subject to probability laws? Well, this is another mystery, right? It's another puzzle to be solved. And in order to solve it, you really need all the pieces of the puzzle first to understand the picture. So we'll call this the new interpretation. Because had Bohr and team lived up to 2015 to see another piece of the puzzle, their interpretation of quantum mechanics might have been very different today. And interestingly, it's the same puzzle that solves the proton mystery. Which one? Well, the proton's pentasquark structure that was discovered in 2015. And in that discovery, a proton was found to be four quarks and one antiquark. But this is only at really high energy levels for proton collisions. And this is a slide used in the proton video. If you want more information, you're welcome to go see that video. Um, but there you'll see a positive charge in the middle. Um, also firmly believe that that's a positron and the surrounding ones are electrons. Um, but here in this video, we will simply just refer to it as quarks and antiquarks. 
and uh, please visit that video if you want more information. But it is worth noting that electron collision experiments do show that electrons can produce quarks. All right, but again, we're just for the purpose of this video, we're going to call them quarks and antiquarks. So if you assume the antiquark in the middle of a proton attracts the electron, but the tetrahedral quarks repel it, well, that would explain why when it's only a positron, the electron is attracted and annihilates. But yet, when you add more around it, it's a proton with a second force that repels the electron. And the combination of those forces, the sum of the forces, creates that orbital. Now, if you assume the proton is spinning, it changes the alignment of those tetrahedral quarks because that's the only point where the forces act. And so that electron is constantly being pushed and pulled, sometimes closer, sometimes further. But again, the orbital is the point where the sum of the forces just at those axes are zero. The sum of the forces are zero. So you end up with this kind of probability shape where if you knew exactly where the proton was spinning at any given time, plus all those other forces, right? There's other protons and other electrons in an atom that's affecting an electron. If you knew all of those, well, maybe it's possible to determine where that electron is. And also, if you assume that protons align their tetra uh, tetrahedral axes when in the nucleus of an atom, then it creates a stronger repelling force when they're aligned, creating the different orbital levels. And furthermore, that same spin can explain orbital shapes as a result of temporary alignment during the rotation of opposite spin protons. Now remember you have some protons that are spinning the same way and some that are spinning the opposite way. And at some point, so they're going to align in opposite spin, producing a force that's very different. And lo and behold, you end up with something that kind of kicks the electron out and a dumbbell shape for the p orbital and then different shapes for uh, d and then for f orbitals. But it's essentially cutting what would otherwise be a spherical shape if you look at the dumbbell if it weren't for that temporary alignment of protons as they spin. So no more quantum madness. The nice thing about this is that everything that was described, classical laws can be used in uh, equations. And I'll give an example, a ping pong ball, right? Because a ping pong ball is pulled down by gravity, right? That's one force. And but the second force is pushing it up the air of a blow dryer. Kind of wobbles around there. But there is a force and it can be calculated and it can be ca calculated with certainty if you know all the conditions. Well, what are those conditions? Well, the pull force in this example was gravity and gravity could change. Let's say you do the same experiment on a different planet, like the sun, it would pull it in closer. Well, the blow dryer settings could change. Let's say from low to, to high, where right? so it's the spin, the frequency now of the air that's pushing it away. Well, that forces it further away. Let's say you have more blow dryers that are added at different angles, right? Just like more electrons in the atom. So why should particles be treated any differently?